Welcome to a conversation on international affairs. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Robert McNamara, who is a Regents Lecturer at the University of California uh, this semester. Uh, Mr. McNamara is a 1937 graduate of the university. He served as president of the Ford Motor Company, secretary of defense, and president of the World Bank. His most recent book is, in retrospect, The Tragedy and Lessons of Vietnam, which has just been issued as a paperback with a new appendix, which include re review of the book, both favorable and unfavorable. Uh, Mr. McNamara, welcome back to Berkeley. Thank you, Professor Christ. I'm delighted to be here. Has a lot changed on the campus since you oh, were here? Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, you shouldn't get me started on, <laughs> on uh, reminiscing about those days, but it's physically, it's of course totally different in terms of buildings. Numbers of students, I'm sure, are up 150%. So the physical change is, is great. And one of the things that, that is most noticeable, and to me very heartening, is the percentage of, uh, of minority students. I guess they're not even a minority now. I, I understand the the percentage of, of uh, Asian undergraduates is on the order of 45%. Okay. There's wide representation of both Hispanics and blacks. That is totally different from the time when I was here. And I think it's a great step forward. What, what impact did Cal have on your career and your ways oh, of Oh, again, uh, you shouldn't get me started. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about, about what I was when I came here, and then you'll understand, perhaps. Uh, Neither my mother nor father had ever graduated from college. My father hadn't gone beyond the eighth grade. Uh, they were determined that, that I would go to college. Uh, I took the entrance exams for Stanford. At that time, this was 1932-33, uh, very, very few first-class universities in the country uh, required entrance exams. Stanford did, I passed. But it didn't take me long to figure out that I couldn't possibly, even, even working part-time and uh, receiving scholarships, I couldn't possibly pay the board and room and tuition at Stanford. So I came to Cal. That's the only reason I was here. It's the only first-class university in the country that I could afford to go to. What did I pay? Well, I lived at home. I paid $52 tuition per year. Uh, you, and, and for that, I had the finest education in the world. And, and I'm internally grateful. And you, you remain an, uh, an enthusiastic supporter of the, the notion of a public sector. Oh, public absolutely. Era. You just can't imagine what this university has contributed, not just to me, but to the hundreds of thousands of others who have passed through and to the state of California. I believe that the state of California has been the premier state, which there's no argument over really for the last 50 years. I believe it's been the premier state primarily because of its education system, particularly the university, but also the primary and secondary education system. I think it's on the verge of losing that. Uh, you majored in economics here? Yes. Well, I majored in economics with minors in, in philosophy and mathematics. I really didn't know what I was going to do uh, when I graduated. And then you went on to Harvard. And then I went on to Harvard Graduate School of Business. You have to understand a little bit the nature of the times. I was here from 1933 to 37. 25% uh, of the adult males of this society were unemployed at that time. It was economic chaos. The, we had the two great maritime strikes of uh, the West Coast uh, while I was here in 1934 and 36. I went to sea as a member of the Sailors Union of the Pacific during the summer vacations in 1935 and 1937. The maritime strikes were among the most brutal this country has ever faced. Why did it occur? In part because of this terrible pressure of unemployment on jobs. And the result is that there were so many applicants for jobs that the companies uh, took advantage of it. They were allowing the bosuns on the ships mm -hmm. to sell the jobs. So you couldn't get a job as a sailor unless you paid the bosun off. After they won the strike, one of the most brutal in, in all mm -hmm. of history, there were machine guns on the, the roofs of the, embark the wharves on the Embarcaderos. I saw strikers knock down a person they thought was a scab on Market Street, put his knee on the curb and his ankle on the street and break the bone. It was that kind of a thing. After they won the first strike in 1934, the wages, when I went out, were $20 a month. I wrote on the freshman crew, I lost 15 pounds. I had 20 bed bug bites between the knee and the ankle one time. My, my point is simply that these were extraordinarily difficult times, economic times, and that colored so much of what was going on in our society. And yet, 
President Robert Gordon Sproul and Monroy Deutsch depended on a rural-dominated legislator, very conservative legislator, for the funds permitted total freedom of, speech and ex uh, freedom of speech and expression in this university. It was a wonderful environment. And I learned the meaning of uh, freedom and the meaning of intellectual uh, uh, opportunity. And, and I was confronted with the need to, to understand the conflict at uh, times between obligations and, uh, and rights. Uh, it was a superb education. Well, is it fair to say then that, that Berkeley turned you into an, into a, an enlightenment uh, rationalist? Well, I, or did I, that happen later? I'm, so, I'm sure some people would be willing to classify me that today, but if you think so, I, I think it's a function of Berkeley. And I hope I am, let me just say that. I hope and I am an enlightened uh, rationalist. And to the degree I am, it came from this university. Surely I went to Harvard, and I've, I've in a sense, been educated uh, in all the years since after I graduated from formal education. But my, my uh, basic philosophy, my basic uh, moral standards, my basic ethical values came out of this university. And I'll be eternally grateful. When, when one uh, looks at your career, uh, one, one finds uh, uh, many Robert McNamara's at, at any one time. Uh, uh, a visionary on the one hand, uh, and on the other hand, uh, uh, an organization man, a, a manager of, of large organizations. Uh, uh, when, when I say uh, a visionary, I'm, I'm thinking here of the speeches what you gave at Ford uh, uh, before you left, calling for uh, small cars, safe yeah. cars, and, and safety, time. functionalism, environmental standards, etc. And uh, some people have said to me, uh, and by the way. Uh, while I was at Ford, uh, Mark, my wife, and I didn't live in the, uh, in the suburbs that were populated. You lived in Ann Arbor. We lived in Ann Arbor, a yeah. university community. Uh -huh. We didn't live in, in Gross Point or Bloomfield Hills, where mm -hmm. the majority of, uh, of the executives live, sort of the Greenwich of Detroit, or maybe you'd call it the, the Piedmont of, uh, of <laughs> uh, Detroit. We didn't live there because we wanted our children to be brought up in an academic atmosphere. And I did push for small cars, and I did push for safety, and I did push for environmentalism and functionalism. And people have often said to me, well, you sound like a, a wild hare. How is it that, mm. that uh, you were printed? Oh, by the way, there was Did you, a, did you say the, Berkeley? That was because you went well, to Berkeley? Well, no, I was, just, I was about to say another illustration of this, uh, this lack of adherence to normal standards. Uh, there was a Republican uh, fundraiser, uh, an executive of the company that solicited all the executives for, for funds, and the basic argument was, look, uh, there's a Republican president, your bonus is dependent upon a Republican administration, and, and the economy is good because of that, and the company made money, and you get a bonus and therefore contribute to the Republican Party. Now, without arguing the merits of the Republicans and Democrats, I will simply say that, that I didn't. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and some people have said to me, my God, uh, how is it you were able to stay there? You didn't, you lived in Ann Arbor, a university community, you pushed safety, and you, and you didn't contribute to the Republican how, how did you handle it? Well, in a sense, Henry Ford and I, and more generally, Henry Ford II, who was this, the uh, chief executive officer, one of the major owners, and more generally the board and the owners, and I had a deal. I could make profits for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and as long as I could uh, benefit the company, they would allow me to, uh, to pursue some of these uh, idiosyncrasies. So the next logical question, educated at Berkeley, a, a visionary at Ford, and, and some would even say later, because after all it was you who commissioned the Pentagon uh, papers in the midst of the And, and who in, initiated the poverty-focused program in the World Bank to Third, eliminate uh, absolute uh, poverty so, in the world. So may I ask why you didn't become an academic? I guess I never really felt uh, qualified. Certainly I wasn't qualified educationally. I, I had intended to, and as a matter of fact, I was a, a very young, I think I was at the time the youngest assistant professor at Harvard. I was an assistant professor in the Graduate School of Business. There are those in the college who would not consider that an academic. <laughs> but but, but uh, in any event, I was on the faculty of the Graduate School of Business Administration, and at the beginning of the war, I was on that faculty. I, I began as a young instructor in August of 1940. I was there when the war started. and. Uh, 
and I was working on a PhD at the time. Although I was an assistant professor, mm -hmm. I, I was working on a PhD, and I had every intention of pursuing that. I left the faculty to, uh, to enter the Army, and had every intention of coming back, because my wife and I both had infantile paralysis at the time of EJ Day. Uh, her case was very serious, and I couldn't pay the so hospital So you actually bills. needed the money. Uh, I needed the money, money, that's right. I finally concluded, uh, much as to my regret, that I couldn't go back. Had it not been for that, I, I would have been uh, at least formally an academic. Uh, I say formally because uh, certainly later in life, my, my uh, intellectual interests have ranged far beyond business administration. And I'm not sure I would have been qualified uh, to have been a, a scholar in, in a discipline other than uh, business administration. Although I think, uh, looking back on my life, I would like to have been. Uh, you know, people in philosophy and political science departments spend a lot of time uh, thinking about the role of contemplation uh, versus the role of action. Uh, clearly, uh, you are, are a person, although you never took a formal academic position, uh, have, have, have sort of understood these tensions uh, and ambivalences. And I said, I, I sense in your career that these two selves were, were talking to each other in yes, dialogue. As, as that's you know. right. And, and at times, I think there is a tension between what you call contemplation and action. But I think uh, there is less tension than most people believe. And I myself believe a person of action, or an, let's say an administrator, if you will, should, uh, should uh, put more weight on contemplation, what you call contemplation. Should put more weight on, on establishing values in his mind, establishing goals and objectives uh, for himself, uh, for his organization, those he's associated with. Uh, and, and let me phrase it very simplistically. I don't believe there's a contradiction between a uh, uh, soft heart and a hard head. And in, in a sense, I don't believe there's a, 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 con a contradiction between contemplation and action. Action should be founded on contemplation. And those of us who act uh, don't put enough time or don't give enough emphasis to contemplation. Is there a problem in the sense that the logic of action leads down paths that, that you might not have uh, originally contemplated, though? Oh, yes. But when I said those of us who have focused more on action than contemplation should put more weight on contemplation, I'm thinking particularly of contemplation that establishes uh, uh, objectives and particularly uh, establishes values. Mm -hmm. if, if you look at the auto industry just as an illustration, uh, we had tremendous controversy over safety. Uh, and there, it was an attitude in the auto industry that, that uh, it should not be concerned about safety. If one talks about safety, this will scare people away. It'll be hard for you and your audience to believe this, but this is exactly the attitude that existed in part of the, uh, the uh, uh, 1950s. If, if you talk safety to the public, and say we're going to do certain things to the automobiles, put in seat belts or uh, uh, padded instrument panels or uh, take, design the car so the doors won't spring open and so on, and, and, and you, will, you will reduce the injuries in the event of an accident. You'll scare people away from using automobiles. And therefore, the auto industry was in a very real sense officially mm -hmm. opposed to uh, emphasis on safety, either in design or in marketing. Uh, I pushed that in, in the mid-1950s, but there was tremendous opposition. And curiously enough, when the rest of the industry saw we were doing it, they came along, GM and, and Chrysler as well as Ford. But Ford introduced safety in its 1956 models, which were introduced and marketed in September 1955. GM and Chrysler had some with the same characteristics at the same time. We pushed it in marketing. It turned out that the 1956 Ford for reasons totally unrelated to safety, did not sell as well as the 1956 Chevrolet. Mm -hmm. The Automotive News, the trade paper, in the spring of 1956 said derisively, uh, McNamara sells safety, Chevrolet sells cars. Now my simple point is that this was, in a sense, a, reflect, a reflection of lack of contemplation, if you want to call it. What is the objective of, responsibility of, the auto industry it should be to produce safer cars. Cheaper cars, more functional cars, more environmentally 
sustainable cars. So, so what's then the key to, to shaking up an organization so it moves down these new directions? Well, I think to, to, to try to first ensure in your own mind that you understand that there's no contradiction between what I call a soft heart and a hard head, mm -hmm. uh, or there's no contradiction between what I'll call social values on the one hand and a firm's uh, financial strength and sustainability on the other. That's really what I was first trying to prove to myself and then trying to prove to others. Uh, when I left Ford Motor Company, uh, or when I left as president of the company, I was planning and had started uh, preparations toward introducing a small car uh, into this country. I had introduced earlier the Falcon, which was a, a move toward a smaller car, mm -hmm. but I was planning to introduce a small car in this country. It would have been the first small car made by any one of the big three companies. And after I left, that uh, that model pro program was uh, canceled. Now, there were, there were reasons for cancellation, but I think that the cancellation failed to recognize that there was uh, uh, I'll call it a social value to a car of lesser weight. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't have to have a car of 4,000 pounds to take a single person, say a, a housewife, uh, to the market to shop or, or have her drive her children to school. You could have a, a car of 3,000 pounds and that would save a thousand pounds of scarce material and labor. It would save fuel as well. Today, let me, let me take the illustration up today. What are the petroleum executives of this country contemplating today in relation to their industry when they oppose action that will move our country toward increasing the fuel efficiency of our automotive vehicles? I just read the other day that, uh, that uh, gasoline consumption in this country has risen, I think they said 25% uh, per year from 1980 to today. Mm -hmm. That is disgraceful. In the first place, our, our fuel consumption per capita, automotive fuel consumption per capita, is roughly twice that of, say, Germany. Uh, and, and this is a problem. It's an environmental problem. We're putting more greenhouse gas emissions in the upper atmosphere. That's going to lead to climate change. It's a financial problem. It costs us far more. It's a security problem. This fuel comes out of the Middle East, and we're, we're more dependent on a very volatile reason. And we're not, in a sense, we're not buying anything for it. We're not buying greater comfort, more convenience, uh, greater mobility. We could achieve the, the comfort, the convenience, the safety, the mobility with much greater fuel efficiency. The automobile industry today, I think responsibly, some of the companies reluctantly, but I think Ford particularly uh, uh, enthusiastically, would, would move toward that. The, the, uh, the petroleum companies are not. There are some exceptions. I think Shell, I was a director of Royal Dutch Petroleum, I think they would be willing to support it, but otherwise not. Now, my, I come back to contemplation. I think it is the responsibility of a leader an action-oriented individual in our society, whether public sector leader or private sector leader, uh, a, to, in a sense to contemplate as well as to act, and to think what his role in society is. And I want to submit to you that the role in society of a petroleum executive today, in addition to making profits for his company, ought to be to help society increase efficiency in the use of petroleum. Mm -hmm. well, and I don't think they think of themselves that way. They should. Uh, definitely leaders of private organizations don't, and, and sometimes one can even wonder about our political uh, leaders, which leads me to a question. Why did you never uh, uh, run for public office as a well, man let, who, let me, who combines this contemplation? Well, let action? me say that, that uh, in 1964, uh, before the election of 64, when Johnson uh, was running against Goldwater, uh, Lyndon Johnson asked me if I would accept nomination as his vice president. And I said no. Mm -hmm. I said no. I'll tell you in a moment why I said no. Mm -hmm. But I also should hasten to add that, that knowing Lyndon Johnson as well as I did, I don't want to say that had I said yes, Mm -hmm. He would have accepted. He might well come along, you know, a week or two later, and said, "Bob, I'm so grateful to you for accepting my invitation to serve as 
sacrifice for it, but I just couldn't ask Margaret, mm -hmm. uh, my wife, or your children to accept that, that mm -hmm. uh, sacrifice. I know what it would mean to your family. So as happy as I am you accepted, uh, I, you shouldn't do it. But I, I didn't say yes, I said no. Now why did I say no? Not because I didn't uh, uh, put great uh, value on public service. As a matter of fact, I think if I had my life to live over again, I would seek to develop uh, capability to, to run for elected office. I think it is one of the highest forms of service to our society. At the time, I was wise enough to know I didn't have that ability. I'd never run for anything. You shouldn't start your, your elected career running for the vice presidency. So uh, I was very wise, I think, in turning it down. But as I say, if I had it, my life to live over again, I would try to develop a capability to uh, succeed in elective office. And, and is, the, is the virtue of politics that there's a feedback mechanism, that, that, you, that you have your ears to the ground and in essence hear what well, I think that's Well, I think that's a requirement of, for a successful politician. The virtue of politics to me is that you're serving your country and you're serving your people. And I think that's uh, one of the, uh, the highest forms of uh, human activity. Right. Uh, let, let's talk a little about uh, uh, your your operating philosophy. You're, you're really, you were always and remain a, a, a liberal, enthusiastic about the role of government. Well, I hope so. And as a matter of fact, in the election, uh, what would it have been? It would have been, uh, uh, I guess, the election, Reagan's second term election. The word liberal was so despised that uh, finally Cy Vance and I and some others paid for an ad in the New York Times saying we were proud to be liberals. Mm -hmm. and We thought our society should understand what liberalism meant. The denigration of it was irrational, unreasonable, and ultimately a disservice to the society. I believed it then, I believe it today. And why uh, do you think that uh, that uh, uh, philosophy has come into such uh, uh, disrepute? I, I guess really the, the high point was when the Kennedy administration yeah, well, came in. That's right. And the, the high point was the inaugural address of, of uh, President Kennedy when he used those famous words, ask not what your society can do for you, ask what you can do for your society. That for your country. For, for your, your country. country right. Yeah, for your, society, your country. Yeah. That's what uh, uh, citizenship meant to me then. It's what it means for me today. But that is not widely accepted today. Why now? Because people have totally lost confidence in their government and those who serve it. Now, why have they lost confidence in their government? Several events have contributed to it. Certainly Vietnam and the tragedy of that uh, and the controversy of it contributed to it. Surely Watergate and Nixon's uh, career contributed to it. Uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, the, the loss of respect for government and those who serve it has been uh, contributed to by, by many of our recent political leaders, including Democrats, President Carter. Uh, when he was running, uh, severely criticized bureaucracy. Uh, President Reagan did, President Bush has. Uh, I think that's unwarranted. I don't mean to say that the government servants are all perfect, all misunderstanding, but what I do mean to say is that the senior public servants that I served with and the senior public servants that I have observed, including the senior public servants of today, both Republicans and Democrats, are at least as competent at least as dedicated as their private sector counterparts. And they're paid far, far less. I was in a meeting uh, a month ago and, and addressing this theme, and I, and, and I saw sitting in front of me, in the front row of the audience, a federal judge whom I didn't know well, but I knew he was very competent. And I said, you people in this audience don't, don't agree with me on this. I said, and I want to tell you something. Here is sitting in front of me a federal judge he has dedicated his life to serving you. He has a lifetime tenure as a judge. He's working 12 and 14 hours a day for you, and he's being paid less than 10% of what he could learn in private legal practice. We should admire that, and he's not unique. Others in the government are doing the same. So will the pendulum swing back to what, well, what you're saying? I hope it will. I'm very pleased you're asking, <laughs> asking the questions, and somebody hopefully uh, will listen to the answers, and I hope they'll be moved by it.
another uh, well, aspect. Let me, let me, yeah, let me yeah, say, I, I am here, as you said, as a regent professor, and I'm, I'm, I'm associated in part with the School of Public Policy, and they sent me a document to read on the plane as I came out a few days ago. And I just want to read two or three sentences please, that yeah, the dean, uh, dean Smolensky wrote, because it deals with this exact point. He said, I'm tired of the cynical denigration of government. Of course, government can do better. But it does good now. It does good now. That's exactly the point. Surely government can do better. It's not perfect. But I simply want to tell you, if you want to talk about competence, uh, if you want to talk about dedication, uh, it does at least as well as the private sector. And both can do better and both should do better. Uh, when you came into the Kennedy administration uh, from Ford, uh, uh, I think you were uh, perceived as a manager of large organizations par excellence. And in looking back at your career in, in 67, you said management is the gate through which social and economic and political change, indeed change in every direction, is diffused through society. And, and you also said in 62, running the Department of Defense is not different from running Ford Motor Company or the Catholic Church, for that matter. Once you get to a certain scale, it's all the same. Well, that was, that was a, a, a simplification. There was, there's much truth in it, but if you want to say running the Defense Department, which at times carries a responsibility for putting the youth of this country at the risk of death, if you want to say that's not different from running Ford, of course it's different from Ford. But if, if you go beyond that and say, uh, running the Defense Department, including times when you put the youth of this country at risk, requires many of the same skills, attitudes, philosophical values, mm -hmm. approaches, as does managing Ford or the Catholic Church. Yes, there are very great similarities between the two. And if you doubt that, you should read, uh, read the books on the Vatican Council uh, uh, that, that were written of Pope John. I'm not a Catholic, but I, I read them with tremendous interest because Pope John created a revolution mm -hmm. in the Catholic Church. And there are, there are two volumes written anonymously describing how he brought about the revolution. And it is exactly the, the approach, the organizational approach, if you will, that a person should take in bringing out a revolution, bring along a revolution in government or in, in business. And what is the key ingredient? The first point is to have an objective. Mm -hmm. And Pope John had an objective for the Catholic Church. Have an objective for, for Ford Motor Company. Have an objective for government. I, and by the way, on that point, I might take a second. In the book you mentioned, I, I uh, comment on some of my conversations with Presidents Kennedy and Johnson. And, and one page I say, I went in to see President Kennedy one day. I just loved and admired him. And I said, Mr. President, I, I have a view of of uh, the office of the presidency and, and uh, the way in which it should be uh, handled, and I'd like to express it to you and have your comment. And he said, sure. And I said, look, I can, I, I'll graph it for you. I said, on the vertical axis is power, and on the horizontal axis is time. Mm -hmm. And you come into office at zero years, and you've got eight years ahead of you, hopefully, and you have, have uh, uh, a certain amount of power at that time. I hope when you leave, you'll go out with zero power. And I hope you will have expended the power in the interest of achieving the objectives that you feel our society should be moving toward. Now that, and, and he said, by the way, he, he said, Bob, that's exactly the way I look at it. Now the point of the story in relation to your question is, you have to have an objective. What are you there for as president? And uh, if you don't have an objective, you can't expend your power to achieve the objective. You're, the president's job is to help lead the country not as a dictator, but as a persuader. Lead a democracy. To lead a democracy, you need the concept of values and, and objectives, and you need then to put your concepts uh, at risk uh, in the, the uh, forum of public debate, and have them debated, and hopefully move the people to support them, and move the society to that. Kennedy thought that way. In the liberal administrations that you were in, both Kennedy and Johnson, so th there, were, there, were, there were two big goals then, following what you said. One was uh, 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 the continuation of the New Deal reforms, which ultimately became the Great Society. But the other was uh, 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 exercising, in a responsible way, American power 
in the world. Well, there were basically. three. I'd say there were three goals. Uh, one was civil rights. That's somewhat different than the New Deal and the Great Society. Okay. One was civil rights, and I think both Kennedy uh, had it and Johnson had it. And Johnson moved. Uh, Johnson, a Southerner, a Texan, moved to put through the Civil Rights Bill and the Voting Rights Act. And people didn't think he would do that. They didn't think he would turn his back, if you will. They thought well, he would turn his back. Or, or they, they didn't think he would, he would turn his back right. on the South, right. which in a sense oh, he did. Right. Yeah. Uh, and he opposed the Southerners, Dick Russell uh, from Georgia and many others who, mm -hmm. who opposed the Civil Rights Bill. Uh, and, uh, and who opposed the Voting Rights Bill. And Johnson led the fight on the Civil Rights Bill, in part because, in a sense, he inherited that bill, if you will, from President Kennedy, and he, he thought he owed it to the president, and he didn't want to be criticized for not mm -hmm. uh, pursuing the civil rights idea that Kennedy had had. But also, he fought for it because he believed it. And when the Voting Rights Act came up, it was his bill, and it certainly wasn't inherited from Kennedy, and he fought to the nail to to get it through. And I observed and participated in discussions he had on both of those bills, and he fought. So that was one, one tremendous achievement. And the number two? The, the number two was, I'll call it following what you said, the, the uh, Rooseveltian philosophy of the role of government, particularly dealing with poverty mm -hmm. in our, and the great society was focused on, on dealing with, with poor, uh, the Job Corps and the, and the uh, Head Start program and, uh, and so on. And, and we've turned our back on a lot of that. And today, in this society, I think it's a disgrace. In the, country, the richest country in the world, the, the percentage of children below the poverty line has risen by a third mm -hmm. in the last decade or so. And today, we have 20% of our children below the poverty line. That is twice the level in Germany or Canada, who are less wealthy than we. I think that's a disgrace. Now, Johnson was determined to, in a sense, avoid that. So his great society was that. And then both Kennedy and Johnson pursued what I will call a responsible role for the U.S. in international affairs. We've turned our back on that. Look what we're doing in, in the United Nations today. We have failed to pay our general assessments to the U.N. We're, we are the, 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 uh, the country that owes more to the United Nations in, in unpaid dues than any other. We've failed to pay our our assessments for general administration. We've failed to pay our peacekeeping assessments. We've failed to fulfill our obligations to the multilateral financial institutions, the World Bank, for example. We have cut our, our official development assistance program, the program of foreign aid to the other countries of the world, which, by the way, amounts today to something on the order of 0.15% of GDP. It's less than half of that of the other OECD nations, the lowest of any industrial nation in the world. In all of these respects, we're failing to carry out our responsibilities to the world. It was this third goal, though, in, in the time that you were in office where things went awry. And, and what I'm curious about, and, and I know you've written this uh, uh, very impressive uh, uh, book, uh, and, and it's hard in a, in a brief interview, but, but in a nutshell, what went wrong with our goals, and why well, couldn't we adjust uh, them as things began to unravel? Well, I think, I think what went wrong uh, was a basic uh, misunderstanding of, uh, of the threat to our security, or a misevaluation of the threat to our security represented by the North Vietnamese pressure on South Vietnam. It led President Eisenhower in 1954 to say that if Vietnam were lost, or if uh, Laos and Vietnam were lost, uh, the dominoes would fall. That was a famous expression, the dominoes mm -hmm. will fall. It wasn't just President Eisenhower believed it. The, I'll call it the establishment in the U.S. And it didn't matter whether you were Republican or Democrat. If, you, if you'd been associated with foreign relations and, and responsibilities in the post-war period in dealing with the, the Soviet threat to the security of the West, and it was, it was a very real threat, mm -hmm. there's no question of that. Uh, I think we, we all in the 50s and 60s may have exaggerated it, but there's no question it was a threat. During the seven years I was secretary, on three occasions we came very, very close to war with the Soviet Union. They put pressure 
on West Berlin to take West Berlin from NATO in August of 61. We came close to war then. They introduced uh, nuclear weapons into Cuba. We came close to nuclear war with the Soviets then, and that was in October 62. They were were backing Egypt to destroy Israel, eliminate it from the face of the earth. In June of 67, the hotline was used for the first time in connection with that. The message from Kasigan, the, the Prime Minister of the Soviet Union, to Johnson was, if you want war, you'll get it. So we, 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 we faced this, what we considered, a terrible threat to Western security from the, the Soviet communists, the Chinese communists. I think we exaggerated, but it, to some degree it was real. But with respect to to Southeast Asia, I am certain we exaggerated the threat. I doubt that had we never intervened, I now doubt that uh, the dominoes would have fallen. I doubt that all of Asia would have fallen under communist control. I doubt that the security of the West would have been materially and adversely affected had we not intervened. Or had we withdrawn after it became clear that we were having serious problems militarily. That was our major error. Now, why did it occur? Well, it occurred for many reasons, but one of them was we didn't know our opposition. We didn't, we didn't understand the Chinese. We didn't understand the, the Vietnamese, particularly the North Vietnamese. So the first lesson is know your opponents. And I want to submit to you, we haven't learned the lesson. Mm -hmm. We don't know our opponents today or our potential opponents today. We don't understand the Chinese today. Look the way we've been behaving. I don't know who's more stupid today, the Chinese, the Taiwanese, <laughs> or ourselves. Mm -hmm. But you know, there were, there were live, live warheads being uh, shot into the Formosa Straits mm -hmm. within the past week or two. There was a threat of Chinese military action against Taiwan. There was action in the Congress that gave every reason to believe that if there were Chinese military action against Taiwan, we would go to war with China. Over what? For what reason? With what benefit? To whom? With what cost? We don't understand China today. Bosnia. Do we understand the Serbs, the Croats, and the Muslims today? I doubt it. I don't think so. Do we understand the Muslim fundamentalists today? I don't think it. I think this country is quite ignorant of many of the facets of the world that we must gain greater knowledge of if we're to act intelligently and responsibly in relation to these other uh, cultures in the world. And, and to go back to a point I made earlier, you ask the, what difference I observe in uh, the University of California at Berkeley today versus when I was here. As I said then, one of the greatest differences, 45% of the students are Asian, at least we've made that step forward. And that, I think, is a tremendous step. We're going to understand the Asians better. And by the way, they're going to understand us better as a result of that. And each of us, if, if we're ignorant of them, let me tell you, they're ignorant of us. I, I hear in the course of our discussion, you're, you're really sensitive because of your, your education and, and the person you are to the need for change in an organization. And, and in your book, uh, in great detail, uh, you, you cover the course of the war and, and you really sort of talk about uh, uh, the way your position was uh, evolving as you conducted the war. And, and you were, in a way, put in a, in a kind of tragic dilemma, were you not, in the sense of, of, of trying to change the course of the war, but, but limited by what you felt was a responsibility uh, to the president and well, the government that you were part yes, of. Yes, it wasn't so much the responsibility of the president I felt limited to me, but rather the contradiction, uh, or the dilemma if you want to put it that way, between a belief, and I believed it then, that the dominoes would fall mm -hmm. if we lost Vietnam. Uh, I say today, I think that w was an exaggeration. Uh, but I believed it then. It was certainly the conventional wisdom upon, uh, uh, among what I'm going to call the uh, foreign uh, policy establishment elite, no question about that. The, the leaders of our foreign policy establishment, uh, the Bob Lovitz, the Jack McCloys, the Dean Atchison's, mm -hmm. uh, and so on, uh, all believed it uh, at the time. Uh, I believed it. I think we were wrong, and certainly I misjudged that. But, but that was one belief I held. The other belief I held, which was not held by many of my associates at the time, was that we couldn't win militarily mm -hmm. in Vietnam. And 
so I had a contradiction in a sense. If I believed that losing would, uh, would advance the cause of, I'll call it communism, across the world, both Chinese communism and Soviet communism, and yet I thought we couldn't win, what to do? Mm -hmm. And what I said then was that we should shift emphasis from the, what I call the military track toward the political track and seek to engage in negotiations to try to withdraw our, our forces militarily without uh, seriously weakening the position of the West vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, Chinese communism and, and Soviet communism. So that was the course I was, was pushing and trying to pursue. And uh, I clearly wasn't persuasive enough. And, and in, in the back of, of the political leader's mind, here I'm talking about uh, Johnson primarily, I mean, uh, uh, what, to what extent was he worried about, uh, A, the Soviet Union as a military threat, B, uh, his fear of the political consequences of, of losing what appeared to be a domino, and third, how much was he worried about nuclear weapons, that is, that a, a, a war that he would win would escalate into one in which well, w w well, weapons let, would have to be Let used. me deal with the last point first. Uh, the chiefs, uh, on two or three occasions, recommended action in, in Southeast Asia, which they said uh, might lead to a military confrontation with China and the Soviet Union. Uh, in which case, they said, and they were candid and honest, they said it might require the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, they, in effect, were wanting to expand our, our uh, military operations there to possibly involve an uh, invasion by our U.S. ground forces in North Vietnam and or uh, airstrikes against uh, southern China. All this designed to, to reduce the supplies of men and materiel from China through North Vietnam into South Vietnam. And they were honest uh, in saying that, uh, that that might well lead to an expansion of the war uh, against uh, China and Russia, or Soviet Union, and that that might require the use of military. Uh, nuclear weapons. Johnson and I were absolutely opposed to that. We were determined not to involve this country in a war with China and the Soviet Union, and certainly not to involve it in a nuclear war. And I must say that uh, that uh, General Westmoreland, to his credit, in a in a meeting, and General Westmoreland was the U.S. commander in in uh, Vietnam at the time. Uh, to his credit, in a meeting at the University of Texas two or three years ago, when this subject was discussed, said, "You know." At the time, I thought I was fighting with one hand tied behind my back, but I now realize that what Johnson and McNamara were trying to do was prevent mm -hmm. war with China and the Soviet Union, and we did prevent it, and thank God, says Westmoreland. Mm -hmm. Now, this, this was the dilemma we were facing. So that was one of the points, and we were, we were uh, quite... Concerned quite, about the Soviet threat. Yes, yeah, quite successful in doing that. But Johnson, you say, was Johnson worried by the Soviet threat, and was he worried by the fear of the political consequences of not uh, dealing with it effectively? Well, he was certainly worried by the Soviet threat. He held the views of the McCloys and Atchisons and others, and mm -hmm. Eisenhower, that it's, it's a threat. If we lose in Laos and Vietnam, uh, we'll lose Asia, and if we lose Asia, the Soviets will be strengthened worldwide, particularly against Western Europe and North America. So therefore, that is a threat we must oppose. Secondly, and that was a driving motive. The second point you made, fear of the political consequences. What do you mean by that? What you mean is that, that uh, in, the, in the 60s, long after China had been lost mm -hmm. in the 40s and, and early 50s, there was still a charge that, uh, in effect, uh, Truman or, or had lost China, or at least the U.S. had lost China. Mm -hmm. we, and, and uh, Mao had come in and forced Chiang Kai-shek out, and the U.S. failure to support Kang, Chiang Kai-shek had lost China, and that was a terrible political charge and a political uh, liability. And what you're implying is that Johnson uh, had that in his mind and didn't wish to be charged with losing uh, Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right on that, but that was not the driving motive. The driving motive was to prevent 
what he feared would be extension of Soviet and Chinese hegemony across Asia. You were then presented with a problem. You were, uh, you, you, you had your doubts. You were constrained. When one reads your book, the, 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 the general question that arises, not so much the specifics of your particular case, but at what point does a public service, uh, a public servant who, who uh, becomes disaffected uh, from a policy that uh, he has a, uh, uh, been a party to, uh, have a responsibility to uh, take a position in the public debate that may be uh, consistent with what his evolving well, let views me, are. Let me give you, uh, let me separate into two points. At, uh, at what point does a, a public servant who has a disagreement with uh, the president uh, have the responsibility to resign. Mm -hmm. I think it's at a point when he feels he can no longer be effective in, mm -hmm. in uh, pursuing his views. Uh, in the book I say, at the end, Johnson and I, two individuals who loved and respected each other, uh, were engaged in intellectual conflict, if you will. Uh, uh, I couldn't persuade him, he couldn't persuade me. Something had to give. We parted. Now, I, to this day, I don't know, and it sounds odd to say it, but I don't know whether I resigned or was fired. But in any event, we separated. And I think at a certain point, uh, that's appropriate. Uh, up to that point, I felt, uh, number one, I knew he wanted me to continue. Number two, I felt I was being effective. I say my last official act was to, to oppose the addition of 200,000 more troops to uh, Vietnam. I'd been opposing that, uh, opposing the recommendation of General Westmoreland and the chiefs to send 200,000 more troops for several months. I'd been effective. As a matter of fact, I prevented it because after I left, uh, it hadn't been done up to the time I left. It wasn't done after I left. So I felt I stayed because, number one, the president wanted me to. Number two, I thought it was effective. At the end, we parted because we differed. I think that was appropriate. Now. Speaking out, that's a somewhat different issue. And in my case, it was relatively easy to, to uh, say I shouldn't speak out more than I had. I had spoken out a lot. There was a hearing before the Senate Armed Services Committee in, in uh, August of 1967. I resigned uh, March 1 or February 29 of 68. So a few months before I left, there was this tortured hearing before the Senate Armed Services Committee in which uh, at the end of a long day of my testimony, Senator Thurman, who's still, by the way, in the, in the Senate, 93 years <laughs> old, said to me, he pointed his finger at me, he said, Mr. Secretary, you are a communist appeaser. What you've told us today is a no-win policy. Now, he said it because I was saying publicly, in effect, in a sense, what I'd said to the president. Uh, and so the public was aware of that part of my view. Mm -hmm. What the public uh, wasn't aware of, and which I really couldn't describe, discuss when I left, was that we were engaged in very delicate negotiations that I outlined in the book that had been triggered by, oddly enough, by a, a vis visit that Henry Kissinger, who was then a professor at Harvard, had made to what was called the Pugwash meeting in Paris. Uh, the Pugwash uh, organization just received the Nobel Peace Prize mm -hmm. in in Oslo, Norway in November of last year uh, for its activities, uh, contribution, contribution to peace. But in any event, they were meeting in, in Paris in the summer of 67. Kissinger was there. He was approached by two Frenchmen, mm -hmm. Markovich and Obrecht, whom I report on in the book, who said, if the U.S. has a message to take to Ho Chi Minh, we'll deliver it. Now, to illustrate the degree to which we didn't understand the situation in Vietnam at the time. Ho Chi Minh was probably more of a nationalist, I'll call it more of a Tito, than he was a servant or a follower of Khrushchev. We looked upon him as a vassal of the Soviets. He may well have been more of a Tito, a nationalist. In any event, he had lived in Paris during World War II he had lived with this man, Obrecht. He was the godfather of Obrecht's uh, child. 
By the way, Ho Chi Minh, and you can't hardly believe it, had been a pastry cook, if you will, in the Savoy Hotel in London. He lived in this country for, for a time. <laughs> There's a real possibility that if we had understood him better, we, we could have avoided this war. Or after it started, we could have terminated it. And it illustrates my point of how little we knew and understand those people. But to come back to my point, I said to President Johnson and, and Dean Rusk, I know you think there's nothing in this approach by Markovich and Obrecht to Kissinger, uh, and you don't want to pursue it, but let me handle it. Something might come up. We've tried these things before, nothing ever happened. But I will promise not to get us in trouble and let me handle it. So I engaged in a long series of exchanges with Kissinger, uh, with the full knowledge of uh, the Secretary of State and the President over a period of months. Uh, our efforts failed, and I suggest why the book, in part because we were clumsy, in part because maybe there was nothing in it. I don't know. But I know we were clumsy. In any event, our efforts failed. But they were still continuing when I left. And after I left, the president in March of 1968 made a speech in San Antonio in which he put forward publicly the elements of the proposal that we had put forward, I'll call it secretly, through Kissinger to Ho Chi Minh, which became known as the San Antonio Formula. And that ultimately was the foundation for the start of negotiations between North Vietnam and the U.S. and Paris. Uh, now, that was underway when I left. I couldn't talk publicly about this. Beyond that, if it hadn't been, well, the Secretary of Defense of the United States in the midst of a war when 500,000 American young people whose lives are at risk in, a, in the midst of a war in a foreign country can't speak candidly and freely without some constraint public. So those were the reasons. So, so in other words, you, you, you want to separate your particular constraints, but on the other hand, uh, I get the sense in, in, in what I've read that you've written and your participation in the, in the uh, uh, nuclear arms a nuclear weapons discussion in the 80s that you really do believe in public education. You oh, even believed in, oh, in it as you were Secretary absolutely. of Defense. Absolutely, and, and frankly, one of the reasons I'm here at this university as a visiting professor now, a Regents professor, is that I hope to contribute to the public education. And later this afternoon, I'm going to participate in a mm -hmm. panel discussion debating uh, the long-term objectives for nuclear weapons in the world. I think we, the U.S., should lead the world to eliminating nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. I know that's not uh, widely accepted among security experts, but more and more security experts are accepting it. Just as recently as, as uh, a month ago, two months ago, the Stimson Center in Washington published a report signed by four mm -hmm. retired four-star officers, including General Goodpaster, Eisenhower's military assistant, who was later the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, and three other retired four-star U.S. officers recommending elimination of nuclear weapons. Uh, Paul Nitz and I also signed it. The Prime Minister of Australia has just appointed a commission to consider the same subject. Um, General Lee Butler, the former commander of the U.S. Strategic Air Command, is a member, as I am. I think the commission is going to recommend elimination. But it's just the beginning, mm -hmm. assuming it does, it's the beginning of a public education campaign. I strongly believe in public education. And I think it's the responsibility of public officials while they're in office and after they leave office to contribute to that education. Absolutely. I hear uh, another purpose uh, uh, emerging uh, uh, out of our conversation, another purpose of, of your book, which, which uh, is this a fair interpretation that uh, whatever emotional catharsis, whatever uh, 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 going through the, the record on Vietnam that was involved. Uh, another thing here, it may have been important for you to write this uh, book to maintain this commitment to public service uh, as a message to future generations well, about uh, its importance and that errors are made, but nonetheless things are learned from the, those errors. The subtitle of the book is The Tragedy and Lessons of Vietnam. Now, if you don't accept it was a tragedy, then presumably there aren't lessons to be learned that would prevent a similar occurrence in the future. Some people don't think it was a tragedy. Uh, Walt Rostow, professor of history at the University of Texas, who was mm -hmm. Lyndon Johnson's national security advisor, to this day mm -hmm. doesn't believe it was a tragedy. He thinks we've, we've fulfilled a, uh, an important uh, uh, purpose. We achieved our objective. In a sense, we won. And he has, uh, 
he wrote a, a long review for the London Literary Supplement, which I have included in the appendix that says that's just that. I think he's just totally wrong. And I do believe it was a tragedy, and if it was a tragedy, shouldn't we learn lessons? And if those who contributed to it and participated in it uh, can draw those lessons, that's their responsibility to do so. That's one of the major purposes of the book. The last chapter focuses on lessons. Uh, we haven't learned them yet. As a regent's uh, a lecturer, I guess I can co call you professor, and, and your uh, assignment can be with, with, uh, the, the paperback uh, 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 edition of your book, which, uh, as, as you've hinted at, but I should say, includes uh, many of the reviews of the book, so that... Uh, there are 18 uh, of them. Yeah, uh, many, some of which are, are quite critical Very of you. Critical. Uh, critical. of you and so on. So I guess the, the, my, my last question uh, would be a question for Professor uh, McNamara. Uh, and that is uh, recognizing the times will be uh, very different with uh, different historical forces operating. What lessons should students uh, derive from your life and your career? Not well, the lessons of Vietnam, the lessons okay. of your life. Well, one, one, I think, lesson that, that, that I've drawn from my life is the value of, the necessity of freedom of uh, the debate. And that's what I really want to focus on in that book. Uh, if you accept for the minute, and certainly I believe the majority of Americans to do, they do accept it was a tragedy, then shouldn't we debate how it came, came about? Uh, I think that's, that's the lesson from my years in, on this campus. As I suggested earlier, uh, this campus was chaotic when I was here. The society was on the, in a slight exaggeration, not much, on the verge of revolution. 25% of the adult males unemployed. Parents of my classmates were committing suicide because they couldn't provide uh, shelter and food for their families. There was a march of veterans on Washington. You know, this, this was a chaotic period, and yet, it, in that chaos, this university fostered freedom of expression, freedom of debate. Out of that came the advances. I don't mean just from this university, but out of that debate in our society came the advances. And we made tremendous advances. And we should be very proud of those advances. Uh, while it's true that, that we have twice the percentage of our children below the poverty line, uh, as do Germany and, and Canada. It is also true that compared to what existed in the 30s and the 20s, we are taking relatively good care of our elderly today. That came out of the ferment and the debate of the times. We should be very proud of that. And we should go on to responsibly address and debate the best way of solving our other problems today. 40 million people without adequate health care, homeless, crime, drugs, education system deteriorating. These are problems we should debate and develop solutions to through that debate. Mr. McNamara, thank you very much uh, for sharing this time with you and uh, with us and, and for being here on the campus. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation on international affairs.